I'm going to invite you to find in your scriptures in the Old Testament. Turn to the book of Psalms. <laughs> to the very first psalm. Put a finger there. We'll be talking about that in just a bit. I read this week about uh, Bert and John Jacobs. Have you heard of Bert and John Jacobs? Their name is my name too. No, I'm <laughs> well, not quite. <clears throat> you know, before I get too far in this, I need to go ahead and, and say that uh, it's awfully good to have Tony and Sherry. They, Tony came ambling in the other day, and I thought, okay, here's someone needing help, I'm sure. So, And you know what, Tony, I, I mean, I, if I had even thought, I would have had you share, share this morning. So I guess you're stuck listening to me, but next time, please, please. Okay. Ah, where was I? Bert, Bert and John Jacobs. It was about 20 years ago. They're, they're brothers out in the Boston area, and they had a business idea. They wanted to make and sell T-shirts. Have you heard of Bert and John Jacobs? So they gathered together $200, and they had their Chevy Astro van, and they started hitting college campuses and trade shows, trying to see if they can kind of get a start with their line of t-shirts and success was negligible at best they said they lived for a long time they said on peanut butter and jelly they slept in the van they did laundry occasionally and they observed that the chicks were not impressed <laughs> and they thought you know what these are t-shirts and they feel good and they fit good but there's no real appeal. We don't have, we don't have a hook. We don't have a, a, an image or a theme. And so, you know what? They found the theme. They found their image back home in their bedroom where they had grown up. They were there, and it was in a little line drawing that John had done, and they had always just called it the Jake. And we've got a picture of it here. You got it for me, Ryland? Please. There you go. This is the Jake. And there was something about that little drawing, something about the smile, something about the kind of optimism about it, and their little theme, life is good. Well, that was 20 years ago, and they do $100 million in global sales with no advertising. And when they were asked about it, they said, well... We think it's simply we're trying to send a light and upbeat message. And so they have Jake, as they call him, in his Jeep going off-road. And they have Jake and his dog. And they have Jake in his hammock. And they have Jake in the lawn chair. And they have Jake living life and life is good. I thought about that and I thought, you know, there is that light and upbeat and kind of this optimism that, that you want to tie into. But I think, this is Barney's theory, I think that they've also kind of tied into something a little bit deeper. I think that there's something in our hearts a little bit deeper that wants to live the good life, whatever that may be. You know what I'm talking about? There are people who want to live a life that's good. They want the good life. And a lot of times they don't really know how to get there. But I think that that whole life is good and this is the good life. I think that that resonates with us. It resonates with me. And what's interesting is sometimes we don't always understand that this is where the t-shirt meets the scripture. There's a recurring word in the scripture and the word is blessed. You know what blessed really boils down to meaning? The good life. There's the longing for the good life. And there are those that find it. And there are those that live it. And Psalm 1 is kind of a gateway to the rest of the Psalms, obviously. But Psalm 1 kind of sends out this message about the good life. And it doesn't just kind of champion the good life. It tells us about it. 
And it tells us about the man or the woman that would live the good life and what things they don't do and what things they do. It's a short psalm, Psalm 1. Why don't you turn with me? We'll read the entire psalm. You all don't have lunch plans, do you? Because this may take a while. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. God, thank you for your good words. I pray you would speak to us from those words today. Amen. Here's the man who's blessed. And we're told first what he does not do. We're told three things that he does not do, and they come to us in terms of postures. And sometimes we read it pretty quick. What I want to do is kind of take a look at what the blessed life does not do. And I, like I said, I find it instructive that they use postures. So keep your Bible open. We're going to walk it through, all right? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Does not take the advice of the wicked, right? Walk in the counsel means take the advice of. But we see wicked and we don't really know what that means. You know, because sometimes we even use it as a good word, right? Like we're impressed. Oh, that's wicked. Or that baseball player who has a wicked curveball, right? But biblically, you know what wicked means? This is where you're supposed to say, no. <laughs> you know what wicked means? At its heart, at its heart it means unrest. There's no rest for the wicked. You know why? Because the wicked bring unrest. That's what they traffic in. They traffic in stirring it up. They traffic in bringing trouble. Or if you want to be a little more modern, they do drama. They create it, they feed it. Ever brush up against some folks that do drama? Ever brush up against the folks that seem to carry unrest? They have a way of stirring the pot, as it were. Ever brush up against those folks? Eh? Oh, come on. Anybody? Let me tell you something. Here's the way to the life that is good. Don't take advice from them. Because they're very free to give you their opinion and their advice, right? Well, if it was me, I'd just go in there and I would tell them. And I think, you know, oh my God, if they take that advice, all that's going to happen is it gets worse. You want a way to the good life? Don't take the advice of those who live and create unrest. Push them off the stage so they can't do the drama and don't do the drama with them. It will make your life better. It will lead you to a life that's good. That's one of the things we don't do. Next, what's the next posture? You see it? It's still in verse 1. They don't walk in the council. They don't take the advice of the wicked. Here's the next one. They don't stand in the way or in the path of sinners. Meaning, they don't take these people as their example. To stand with or to stand in the way of someone is to take their example as your own. And when it talks about sinners, sometimes we don't know what that means. You know what this word means? Is where you say, what? <laughs> this is the common word in the scriptures for sin or sinner. And it means one who misses the mark. Now you see that and it seems kind of innocuous a little bit. Like, okay, they were trying, they just kind of missed. They took their best shot, but they just kind of missed. That's not the idea. The idea is this. They missed the mark because they were aiming at the wrong thing. They missed the mark because they don't aim at all. They're sinners because they're aiming at the wrong things in life. They're aiming at those things that really don't bring life. They, they're aiming at those things that destroy the life of God in them. Don't follow that. 
Don't take that as your example. There are plenty of people, watch the news, there are plenty of people who aim at entirely wrong things. Why would we take that as our example? What would we hope to gain? Maybe we can get the wonderful life that they're living. Not. Here's what the blessed life doesn't do. It doesn't take the advice of the wicked. And it doesn't take the life of those who missed the mark as their example. I'm not going to wade too far in these waters. Can I, can I just offer this though? This is free. I'm not ready to buy in to what ESPN thinks is courageous. I think we've missed the mark. I will not take that as my example of courage. You with me? Picking up what I'm laying down, as they say. The way to the good life is not only that we don't take the advice of the wicked, we don't take the example of those who missed the mark and take it as something that we are to follow. Here's the last part that we do not do. You don't sit in the seat of scoffers. When you sit in the seat of someone, you take that same attitude. Okay, So sitting in the seat of the scoffer is to say, I'm going to take the attitude of this person. And the idea of a scoffer is simply, that's not one that we use a whole lot either. Scoffing. Here's the idea. The scoffer is the one who mocks the things that matter most. The scoffer is the one who mocks what's sacred and precious, what gives life meaning, what brings meaning to life. They scoff at that. Why would we embrace that attitude? I, don't, I do not know the, the writer's first name. His last name is Weiser. And he makes this observation. He says, the tragedy in life is when those make a mockery of the very things it should be the mainstays in their life. That's pretty good. The tragedy in a life is when one mocks the very things that should be the mainstays in their lives. That's what we do not do. The life that is blessed, the man that is blessed, he does not do the walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not do the stand in the way of those who miss the mark and he does not sit down with and enter into the attitude of those who mock what matters most. Now here's my part of the more you know, the more you know. That's my theory. The more you know, the more you know. These postures pop up another place. Did you know that? They pop up another place in the scripture. These three pop up again. I won't ask you to read it, but if you have pen and paper, you may want to write this down. Ephesians 2, 6 talks about God's work in a human life. It says, He seated us in the heavenlies. What attitude do you want to take? Those who mock what matters most or the attitude of heaven? That's the change of a life that God can bring. And that's a different kind of posture. Same posture, very different direction. I want to embrace the attitude of heaven, not the attitude of those who mock what matters most. Which do you think is going to lead you to a good life? Eh? Ephesians 5.2 Walk in love as Jesus loved. What example are we going to take? What advice would we take? Would we take it of those who bring unrest? Or would we take the advice of the one who desires the best for another? Which one are you going to take? It's a choice. Ephesians six thirteen, And having done all, in regard to the armor of God, stand. Do I want to stand in the way and with the example of those who missed the mark? Or do I want to stand with the full armor of God and having done everything, I stand? The way of the good life is a way of postures. We have to choose not just the posture, but what kind of posture will it be? It's a powerful image. That's what the blessed life doesn't do. We don't 
walk in the advice of the wicked. We don't stand taking our example from those who miss the mark and we don't sit and pull up a chair with those who mock what matters most. Now what about what the blessed life does? That's verse 2. It tells us two things. We delight in the law of the Lord and we meditate on it. Okay. I'm going to try to not be boring, so just hold on with me, okay? When we talk about the law of God, it's it's like automatically we think in terms of legal terms, we think of legal ease, we think of legislature, we think of legality and legislation and all that sort of stuff. No, no, that's not really the heart. When it talks about delighting in the Torah of God, the Torah of God is more than simply, here's the rule. When there's direction given, there's usually some truth or wisdom packaged in to the direction. And so what happens is you're going beyond a particular law or rule to a way. And that that law or rule is designed, or at least the intention of the law or the rule, is to convey to us something deeper, a way of living. You with me? No. Let me give you an example. When we talk about the law and the Torah of God as the way of God... Think Western. And here's the guy who's ridden in to clean up the town. But there's the bad element that's there that he has to deal with. And then the lovely young love interest, right, that's in the Western, comes up and says, You don't have to go. Don't go face them down. And then he says, I've got to, Miss Daisy. Because it's the law of the West. What law? The way. There is a way which is I will go out and meet. It's not necessarily let's look up to see what rule and regulation. It's the law of the West. When we talk about the Torah as the law, what we really mean is it's the Torah of the West. Okay, of God. The specific instructions he gives have packaged within it the way life is to be done that's the Torah and we are to delight in it you know why I think here's the deal about delighting in the law of God in the way of God if we desire God I think we can delight in his way but if we're not really feeling it about his way and his law if we check we'll probably find out that there isn't a big desire to know God when we have a desire to know God We start to delight in the way of God. And then it says we meditate on it. We dwell on it. But it means more than dwell on it. And this is really the cool thing. You know what meditate means? Where we get the word? Let me back up a second. On my birthday, which was July 14th, I share that with Judy Dorsey. And so I got all sorts of wonderful Facebook uh, greetings. I got four dollars total as far as people giving me a card with a dollar in it so it was a pretty good year for me but you know what else i got a little facebook message from someone who had a poster that they sent to me of a cow and it noted that july 14th is national cow appreciation day and i share it on my birthday what does that have to do with this not a lot i was just bitter no i'm just here's what it has to do Meditate means means to chew the cud. It's what it means. You chew on it. You work on it. You think on it. You don't just take it in mindlessly. You work it through. You think it through. You carry it with you. You chew on it. To meditate means to chew the cud. It isn't just swallowed whole. It is considered. It is dwelt upon. It is processed. And here's the other thing that we have to understand. Because this is transformational. After enough chewing on the cud, guess what? Cud becomes cow. Eh? We meditate on his word. Why? Because eventually, just as cud becomes cow, his word becomes becomes part of me. John 1.14, we hear this all the time and we hear it at Christmas and it's so true. Remember, it's talking about Jesus and it says, the word became what? Flesh. Now that is unique to Jesus, but the idea in a, in, in a, in a more general way applies to us. 
Meditate on the word. Why? Because when I chew the cud, the cud becomes this cow. Not this cow. It's <laughs> what happens when you get away from your notes, okay? The word becomes flesh in me, and I live it. Scriptures in Psalm 1 says that's a life that's truly the good life, where the word is becoming flesh. It lives not only in me, I live that because it's part of me. Isn't it amazing? What time is it? I've got one minute and I had a lot of other really good stuff to say. I'm going to say just a few not as good things, okay? Here's the third, third idea in the psalm. It's a picture of the good life, according to Psalm 1. The life, here are the three things that it does not do. Here are the two things that that life does. And now here's the picture. You know what the picture is? It's of a tree. You know, its bark is worse than its bite. <laughs> Just wanted to branch out on that. No, okay. Out on a limb. We'll leave it alone. Okay. <clears throat> I feel like a sap. Okay. Here's the picture of the tree. It's firmly planted. It's not going anywhere. Roots are deep. It's well watered. This is a life of strength. It's a picture of strength. It is a life that bears fruit. It is a life that's vital. It's a life, listen, of substance. It produces something. And its leaf doesn't wither. Meaning, stability. It can be counted on. That's the picture of a life that's blessed. Of the good life. The image is strength. It's a life of substance, and it's a life that can be counted on. I'd sign up for that, wouldn't you? I'd sign up for a life that's deeply rooted. I'd sign up for a life that bears fruit. I'd sign up for a life that doesn't wither. That's what you have. But there is more, because while I would not claim to be a dendrologist, one who studies woody plants, I do know a little bit about trees. Did you know that trees take in CO2 and give out oxygen? You know what that means? They make the atmosphere where they are better. Trees, through their root system, hold soil. Which means they hold things together around them. We know trees. I know trees very well from Kentucky. Trees are great for shade, but they also provide shelter for life and with fruit and other parts they sustain others the picture of a tree is not just this image of wow isn't that a great life it's a picture of a life that makes everything around it better that's a blessed life and I'm out of time I'll leave you with this thought there is a promise at the end of the psalm And the promise is simply this. God knows the way of the righteous. He's aware. He attends to it. He approves and values it. This is a life that is not born of coincidence. It's a life born of choice. Right? It's a life born of choice. Who are we going to listen to? What example will we take? What attitude will we embrace? What will we invest ourselves in? Will we delight in His Word? Will we chew on it so that it becomes us? Those are things we choose. It's a life we choose. And choose in response, but it's still upon us to make that choice. And so for those who are living life and the life really isn't that good, here's what I want to know. What have you been choosing? And maybe you've entered into a life and it isn't all that good. And maybe you're living a life where you realize this isn't the good life at all. You know what I'm suspecting? It's probably tied to some choices. Blessed doesn't mean the comfortable life. Blessed means the life that's deeply good. And that comes by choice. And God knows the way of those who are choosing that life. I'll leave you with that.